How's everyone else doing? It's the last talk of the day. <laughs> Still got a lot of energy. You know, I was, uh, the first day I was streaming the 101 track, and there was a lot of people that were, uh, you know, coming up here and, and encouraging people not to go to the talks. They're like, oh, it's just, it's always uploaded on YouTube. Why would you go to the talks? And I'm usually one of those people. I'm usually the person that thinks that you're crazy if you're going to come to a talk and stand in all those lines. Mostly it's the lines. Being from Wyoming, lines aren't a thing, so it like makes my heart hurt when I see people standing in line. Um, but, I don't know, to encourage people not to come to a talk, that's, um, that's not, uh, I, I'd say it's misguided, because there's something about being a part of an audience that's just electric. And, you know, this is no surprise. You know, if you think about any sort of sitcom that's out there, what do they do? They pipe audience into your living room. They're piping uh, soundtracks into you, or uh, canned laughter into you, just to make you feel that you're doing the right thing. To make you feel that, oh, I shouldn't have to go make real friends. Um, I've got all the friends I need here in my living room. So, I mean, it kind of makes you wonder. It's like, um, oh, so first off, yeah, thank you. Thank you for um, braving the, uh, the colds and the sinuses, infections and whatnot, and being here with me today. Um, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, there's something electric about being in the audience. And it, it makes you think, it's like, what is that? What is that that's programming us to like, to, to yearn to be a part of these social uh, interactions and you know if things like laughter canned laughter can program us to act differently you know just how open how vulnerable are we and I thought yeah well let's just examine one of the hardest cases that we know about and I'm talking about Colonel version Helen Keller she was blind deaf and mute and look at that she's still reading you're still piping input into her teaching her who knows what <laughs> <laughs> So it's like, if she's, she's the most locked down system I could think of, and if she's not locked down, how wide open are we? And, you know, I'm joking, but at the same time, I'm really not, because we can't stop stuff from coming into our eyes. We can't stop stuff from, from coming into our ears, mostly. You walk around Vegas, you're bombarded with stuff. So, yeah, what's my motivation? I'm a software engineer by day, but I'm a frustrated consumer by night, or a media consumer. You know, it's one of those things that says you just feel icky. You feel that, like, propaganda is just all over you. You know, you can't escape it. Um, so what can you do about it? You figure that the people who can do something about it are the ones that are doing the propaganda to begin with. You know, you can't expect anybody else to, you know, come to your rescue for you. So I thought, well, I mean, Python solves a lot of my other problems. Could Python solve this problem for me as well? So I guess it's time to take a journey. And it's time to fight your friends in alleyways <laughs> and tell them to put on the glasses. And if you don't get this, you haven't watched They Live, and that's your fault, you're wrong, not me. <laughs> so let's define propaganda. Propaganda is defined in this talk. It's uh, real simple. You have a node A, you have a node B, and you have a communication stream or a data stream. This data stream is an attempt from node A to get node B to behave in such a way that directly benefits, or get node B to act in a way that directly benefits node A. It's real simple. And it goes by many names. You know, advertising, lobbying, social engineering, all of Las Vegas, essentially. That's all one big propaganda. Go away. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so propaganda is defined by this talk. It goes by very many names. And um, you're probably thinking, oh, I do some of these. Am I a propagandist? Yeah, you are. We all propagandize a little bit, for sure. And it's a, it's a level like what we're willing to tolerate. What we as an individual, what we as a society, we're willing to tolerate as far as what we're able to deal with, or what, we're, what we find acceptable in propaganda. But what about the word? I'd like to give a little history of the word. Um, because none of, these, none of these words are as scary as propaganda. Propaganda is the only one that really is scary. Maybe social engineering is a little bit scary. But propaganda is the only one that's really scary. You know, the one that's always used as a pejorative. And you've got to ask, well, what's, what's behind that? There's definitely a reason behind that. Uh, propaganda, you know, was, you know, first came into vernacular in, like, you know, the mid-1622. Uh, it, it stood for propagating the faith. Uh, the world was getting 
larger and that like our ships could uh, sail further. The world was also getting smaller and that kingdoms and factions were starting to bump into each other. And so you had like this Pope that's like, God, I don't want to deal with all this shit that's on the outer reaches of my kingdom. I'm just going to, he didn't say that. He speaks Latin. And um, <laughs> he, um, he, uh, you know, he, he stood up this, uh, you know, this propagation, uh, a propagation of faith. And it became effective almost immediately. In fact, like the guy that was in, you know, the, the cardinal that was in charge of the propagation, you know, committee, he was, uh, he was known as the Red Pope. He was essentially an ad hoc pope for all the external kingdoms out there. Very powerful. But even then, I mean, it, it, wasn't a, it wasn't a pejorative. It didn't become a pejorative until, as in like a negative connotation, until World War I, after World War I. What's going on there? Well, World War I, if you, you know, if you, I've listened to George Carlin's, uh, Dan Carlin's um, uh, World War I history. I don't know if uh, I highly recommend it. But, uh, you know, he, he brings up, like, World War I was the first war, you know, major war in, in, um, uh, uh, since, like, the Napoleonic era. So you had this group of people, you know, who weren't used to fighting, and you had to get them spun up. You had to get them hating the other people. And Hitler wrote in Mein Kampf, he wrote a whole chapter on war propaganda. He's like, this is where we failed. The English were, the English and the Russians, they were way better than us. We've got to do a lot better. It was at this time also, and, and Hitler called it propaganda. You know, he, he loved the word. And so that's why it became a bad word here. Edward Bernays, um, uh, you know, he's the father of modern-day propaganda. He wrote, he lived at the same time period, and he was actually wrote in his book, Propaganda, he lamented. He goes, propaganda is such a fine word, and the Nazis went and ruined it. He's like, well, we've got to come up with a different word, and the word he came up with was public relations. You know, that's the term. <laughs> <laughs> Did the Germans learn their lesson? Well, after World War II, was over, the, the liberators or however you want to look at them, were coming through uh, Germany, and they came across the, this uh, man named Reiner Galen, Galen. And they looked at his uh, anti-communism propaganda, and they're like, man, this is good. Can you do this in English? And he was like, yeah, I mean, yes. I can totally do that. And um, it was very effective. We have this uh, retired CIA officer saying that we fed his propaganda, that, you know, his anti-communism um, uh, propaganda, they fed it Pentagon, the president's office. And it was just, it, he called it, it was basically bullshit. It was boogeyman bullshit. So yeah, the Germans did lose, uh, learn their lesson. I mean, they still lost the war, but their propaganda machine was much better. Um, yeah, thanks for sitting through that uh, brief history. Let's fast forward to like, we have the rise of the machines with propaganda. What has that done? Now, you've probably heard a lot of stuff about like how much it costs Google to power, you know, to run their, you know, to just to pay their power bill every day. You've probably heard stuff about how, you know, Target, uh, you know, could predictly, um, predict when one of their customers was pregnant, all those kind of stories. You know, there's just big numbers. We're not really quantifying it as, a, as human brains. But then I saw this, uh, this, um, this really neat article, the heterotopia of Facebook. The thing is, Facebook is, uh, doesn't really matter. This could be any social uh, uh, network out there, on, on, uh, especially online. And yeah, go ahead and go ahead and I highly recommend reading heterotopia of Facebook. And it's, it describes what is going on with the human brain very succinctly when we participate in these social media groups. You know these. Um, these other spaces is what a heterotopia stands for. Heterotopia is where you can go. It's a space that exists in real life, but it's a space that you can go and kind of project and live a sort of, you know, your own utopia. The thing is, everyone else is doing the same thing. So you can get curb stomped if you go out there and project your idea. You can also get your boots licked by a sycophant. What Foucault argues is that, like, whatever happens in these heterotopias, if you're investing real uh, uh, parts of yourself into it, every action that happens inside this heterotopia will have an effect on you in the real world. Because your brain really can't distinguish between the two. It's like, if I was a dumbass in there, why wouldn't I be a dumbass outside? And the answer is, there's no reason. There's nothing stopping you. You are a dumbass. <laughs> that post. That was a shit post. Your whole life's been a shit post. You know? 
So yeah, so let's say you have these heterotopias, these spaces, and you're a propagandist, and you like, you know, a salesman comes up to you and says, look, I have these spaces where people just come and live their lives and interact with all these other people, and it is like a direct pipeline to how they act in the real world. Also, we've had machines and we've recorded everything. Could this be of use to you? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it'd be worth my time, says the propagandist. Obviously, that's not what they say. We know this because um, these industries are titans. Uh, their owners are billionaires. The people, you know, are trying to wine and dine the owners all over the place to try to get their services on, you know, to be beneficial to them. So yeah, these heterotopias or these uh, social media groups that collect all of our data that we invest very real parts of our lives in, it's a very important, it's very important. Let's go back to 1993. Al Gore was talking about, you know, this, this idea of like a gap between the information haves and the information haves not. He's warning that if we don't, you know, provide technology to, you know, uh, poorer populations, they'll just get left behind. Now, in his book, I mean, that's fine. That's a noble, that's a noble thing to say. In his book, Data Smog, oh, yeah, David Schenk, he, he made a really good point. He goes, it, it's one thing if you push technology onto a people, but if you don't upgrade the people, if you don't teach the people, if you don't give them the proper education of what it takes to, you know, uh, to understand what these devices are and what data they're producing, then you're not helping the information gap at all. In fact, you might even be widening it. So what's it take to be information have and information have nots? So what's that gap? Well, the information, to be an information have, it's not that hard. If you know what a tracking cookie is, if you, you know, you, you know why the internet is making these people billions of dollars, if you know those things, if you know what an ad blocker is, you're already in the information haves. If you're one of the, you know, if you're one of these fine, outstanding citizens that need stuff to just work out of the box, you're an information have not. And, um, to, uh, whoops. Yeah. <laughs> I guess I can go to, uh, do we have any examples of information gaps today? Yeah, sorry. Um, I think so. I think one came up not too long ago. In the aftermath of uh, the Orlando shootings, we had a talk, uh, a, a statement from Hillary Clinton. She promised, you know, as president, I will work with our great tech companies from Silicon Valley to Boston. Step up our game. Now, she, she then goes on to give, like, the normal stump speech about intercepting ISIS's communications, tracking and analyzing their media posts, blah, 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 blah. We already know that. There's already been plenty of discussion about that. But what I find interesting is this, as well as promoting credible voices who can provide alternatives to radicalization. She's asking Silicon Valley to team up with them to promote credible, vo credible voices. Promote them, you know, whatever voice you deem necessary. Why do I think this is a, uh, an example of the information gap? Because I don't think she could have got away with saying something like this. As president, I will work with our great net, uh, New York Times and its best seller list, promoting credible books and authors who can provide alternative radicalization. And so, yeah, that's the question. It's like, why can, you know, why can a, um, um, what's the difference between you know, Silicon Valley promoting stuff on their product and New York Times promoting books on their bestseller or promoting books on their bestseller list, it's one of those things where um, you know some people read this, they read about the government messing with their books, and they go, hmm, no, I don't think so. You stop right there, government. But um, uh, uh, you know, why can we let the social media, you know, the government can, uh, you know, talk, you know, a presidential candidate can openly talk about how she would like, uh, you know private companies to help promote propaganda. And this wasn't a one-off thing either. We had this one story you might have seen. Uh, this was in uh, Facebook and Twitter pledged to remove hate speech within 24 hours. This was a story that was in Europe. And inside this article, we see the companies who also agreed to promote independent counter-narratives to fight hate speech, including content promoting non-discrimination, tolerance, and respect. So we have this, you know, we have movements where private uh, companies are asked to, you know, produce propaganda, you know, and uh, are we okay with that? 
All right. So we have, uh, we have like, we have this gap, information haves and information have nots. The best way to get information have nots into the information haves class is for education. Just educate, just educate an information have not into an information haves and it's done. The problem is, is that this runs counter to what a lot of, you know, there's a lot of people that, you know, in their best interest are keeping information have nots. You know, the, the more have nots there are, the more ads, the better ads you can sell or the target the people. And, um, you know, the more surveillance you can collect on people. You know, so there's interest in keeping the information have nots. Now you say, well, if we were to educate these people, what would it be? Thank you very much. That was a good transition to the next slide. So I'm, I'm pulling this from uh, a, uh, a lot of the, this inf uh, uh, propaganda information from this book called Firewall, Firewall, Propaganda's Guide to Self-Defense. Jack Nolan was a, a PSYOP officer himself in the military. And um, if you don't know anything about the military, they have these things called field manuals, and they are like the man pages for war. If you, if you ever find yourself in apocalypse, you'll want to secure a volume. Now, um, he's basically going through the PSYOP, um, uh, uh, basically his training, and he puts it all in this book. So, first off, let's go on, like, what's a propagandist steps? And we see here, it's mostly like, you know, a normal, uh, you know, like a pen testing step. You know, you start off with ID the audience. You know, you want to do some footprinting on them. You want to, you know, determine what the audience is uh, you know, limits are, what you can get them to do, what you can't get them to, them to do. You also want to determine who their ringleaders are. In today's, you know, you know, in today's, you know, social networks, we have all these likes, we have followers. It's easy to tell who the ringleaders are, the end users. But also, you gotta remember that you can also target moderators, you can target sysadmins. A propagandist may just, I mean, it's way easier. What are you going to do? You're going to target a group of people or you can just target a mod who can censor everything for you if you want, if you can get them, you know, turned to your side. Uh, the next thing a propagandist wants to do after ID in his target audience, he needs to, you know, uh, determine a goal state. Most of the time the goal state is to make money. You know, but it could be a lot, a lot of other things. The goal state could be, you know, to uh, get people to hate the other people so you can go to war. But mostly it's to make money. The next thing you want to do is scan for vulnerabilities on a society, on a group of people that you'd like to, uh, you'd like to uh, change their behavior on. These are, you can tell what a society's vulnerabilities are. These are known as hot button issues. If ever you, you're like, ooh, that's a hot button issue, that's a societal vulnerability. That is something that someone could always wedge in there, you know, wedge a wrench in there and try to exploit. This could be race, religion, gender, wealth, you know, these are, uh, you know, things that people are real sensitive about. And, you know, it's up on the society, it's upon the society to really patch these. You can't, you know, if you're always gonna leave this vulnerability open, it's, you know, it's, it, it, um, it'll always be exploited. Choose the theme of the message. This is essentially the exploit of the, ex how, do you, how are you gonna exploit the vulnerability? Are you gonna appear, appeal to fear? Are you gonna appeal to greed? In-group, out-group, that's very powerful. Like I said about people yearning to be a part of a crowd. Uh, if you can get people feeling like they're an out-group, you know, if you can get people feeling like they're an in-group because they continue to do what you want them to do. Uh, these are all different, uh, uh, this is your theme, this is the message that you want to run with, you want to appeal to something of your audience. Fear, greed, yeah, whatever. Next, you want to plan for how to grab attention. This is essentially like your payload that you're going to be delivered. You know, you're going to do TV commercials, you're going to do internet advertising. There are many to choose from. Next, you want to test the message, measure its impact, adjust the message as needed, repeat. In today's day and age, this is very easy to do. Obviously, this is, um, you know, we get immediate feedback on the message and its impact. And, uh, you know, we can adjust it as needed, very quickly, repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. So that's what a propagandist is going to do. That's his steps. What can a propaganda, uh, what can a person do to counter the propaganda? What kind of checklist can they, can they, can they use for themselves? A series of questions you can ask is, can the speaker gain anything from having me listen to them? 
you know, if you're talking to somebody and they, you know, you feel, you know, they, you feel that like, yes, you know, if I listen to them, they have something that they can gain if, you know, if I, if I listen to them and, you know, believe what they say. Ask if the source is verified. All right. So when you're reading articles, um, you know, pay attention to what, uh, um, you know, who's, you know, who is saying what. Sometimes you'll have an unidentified source. Uh, uh, you know, these are good clues. So, you know, white source. Is the source identified? This is like, you know, you know who the author is. You know, I'm the journalist, you know, Glenn Greenwald. I'm publishing this article. Um, uh, you know, he's putting his name out there. If a source is unidentified, you'll see sometimes, like, uh, for instance, in uh, the coup that happened in Turkey, it was an unidentified source that released, uh, you know, that uh, the president or the prime minister uh, was, you know, he had, a, he had sought asylum in Germany. That came from an unidentified source. And that's something that you could look into. I mean, that's something that is a very good clue. If an unidentified leak, you know, ha happens, and the government tries to chase them off to Russia, you know, you can tell that that was not a government, uh, um, you know, sponsored leak. Obviously, they did not like that. However, if a source is in an article that is not identified and doesn't seem to be a big deal, you can bet that that was a sponsored leak. Like, they, you know, the government was okay with that one. And black is a source is falsified. You know, some people like Donald Trump, they say stuff that's never happened before. That is a black uh, uh, verification. That source is, it's a falsified source. He says something that no one else has even said. You also want to ask if the source is credible. Has the source lied to you before? Usually when a journalist does something, like say that they're, they, you know, they took you know, rocket fire or they saw combat in an area, they're done. They're, they're no longer credible. There's no reason for you to believe them. So asking, you know, keep track of your source. Um, um, you know, have they lied to you before? Have they, have they always been truthful? You know, that kind of thing. Ask if you've heard the message repeatedly. If the met, repetition is key to propaganda, it's like their best friend. I, I kind of feel, um, uh, kind of reminds me of like the Unix touch command. When you run touch first, it creates a new file, right? What happens when you run it again on a file? It modifies the M time, right? Modifies that modified time. And the way our brain works is that we rely heavily on modified time. When we go to search for something, we like to go to stuff that has received activity recently. So when you build a, when you send a message out repeatedly, you're building familiarity. We're, uh, you know, when we're, when we're uh, humans, we love familiarity. You know, it means that you're not a tiger that's here to eat me. <laughs> you, know, it, you know, it means that you're uh, uh, a friend, you know. And so that's why everyone's trying to push their label or their commercials or their propaganda on you all the time repeatedly. That's why it's a good sign. That's why it's a good clue. If you're seeing the message repeatedly, you're like, why am I having to see this repeatedly? Think about every time you go into McDonald's, how many golden arches you see. They're trying to build a familiarity presence. All right, manufacturing consent. Uh, this is a book written by Man uh, Noam Chomsky and Edward Herman. And it's coming from the hypothesis that the media mobilizes support for special interests that dominate state and private activity. Basically, the media is not the fourth estate, is what they're deciding, they're, uh, what they're hypothesizing. They're hypothesizing that the media is not this neutral thing, that they will perform you know, to, the, to the needs of the special interests of the society. And to test this hypothesis, they, just, they developed a propaganda model. And what's in this propaganda model? This, all right, one of the things, you, first, propaganda filters. The size, concentration, ownership. Uh, all right, God damn it. Size, concentration of ownership, owner wealth, profit orientation of dominant mass media firms. So in our beloved capitalist systems, uh, these media firms, you know, these businesses in general, they're allowed to grow, they're allowed to buy more, um, um, just everything around them. So you can buy more media companies. You can, you know, that's, um, 
You could buy more things that aren't media companies. And now you have now you have like a you know maybe something that's making money, and you don't want your media firm to be you know to uh, you know to it's you know you're, you have a business that's shady. You don't want your media firm bringing attention to it. You own both of them. That's great. You can just tell the media firm, hey, shut up about this. The media firm will be like, all right, you're the boss. Advertising as a main source of income. This is another thing. So when when media was just sold as a subscription only kind of a thing, uh, the government's, you know, publications were allowed to talk a lot of shit about governments and a lot of people in power. But um, it was hypothesized, like, well, if we just turn it over to the market. And so maybe, maybe the media will kind of sort itself out. It'll get back in line. You know, people won't be as uh, anti-government. And it really worked. And one of the ways, you know, as soon as advertising came in, it allowed for, you know, more rich people than, you know, the rest of the population to come in and, you know, uh, kind of sort of invest in these media companies, allowing them to grow bigger. And so that's another way. If you can't own the media, what you can do is you can own, you know, part of the advertising. That's a way that you can get your own kind of check and balance into, like, what message the media is putting out there. And then we have this idea of like reliance of media on information provided by government experts funded by primary resources. This is where we get the idea of press conferences from. So we have 24 hour news and you know we have a, or at least news that you know we have a newspaper every day, we have a news hour every day and yeah we do have 24 hour news. How do we, how do they have news to give? Well this is where you know, you know, very powerful entities such as governments and corporations can set up a press conference. You're like, oh, you want news? You can just come to this location at this time. There'll be coffee and donuts. You know, we, all you have to do is listen to us tell our side of the story. And that's very important because now you have the media and the government just kind of working together. And you know, you kind of hear about it. You know, when uh, you know someone, you know, some journalist goes out, you know, goes rogue and you know gets their uh, gets their credentials pulled for being allowed into the the you know the press conference. You know, so it gets you know journalists to to kind of stay within bounds so they can stay getting news from these press conferences. And also think about what this does. If like you're on the other side of the world and one of these big entities harms you in some way, you have to wait for a journalist to like fly over and stick a microphone in your face. Whereas in, with press conferences, by the time that journalist gets all across seas to interview the victim, the, you know, on the home side, you know, the, the big entities, they'll have had their uh, opinions in, uh, in uh, you know, the public sphere for who knows how long. You know, so, uh, uh, press conferences are very beneficial. They're very beneficial to both the media and, you know, government and high power entities that can, you know, afford to do these press conferences for journalists. Flack. Flack is a way of disciplining the media. So if ever the media does something bad, you have to have ways that you can uh, uh, tell the media you don't like that. Um, one of the ways you can do this is, you know, you can have counter stories run. You can have, uh, you know, withdraw your advertising, this kind of thing. You just want to make life difficult for any media that dares say something bad about you. Another thing the propaganda model has is it has this thing called boogeyman, boogeyman enemies. When uh, manufacturing consent was, first came out, you know, communists were the boogeyman. And the way they wrote it, it's like they assumed the communists would be the boogeyman forever. We have terrorists as boogeyman today. Another boogeyman we have, as we've been going over before, is hate speech. You know, hate speech is being used, you know, to get social media companies to help uh, propagandize its users. All right. So we learned some things about propaganda. What can we do? Well, I decided to make a Reddit clone. Why did I make a Reddit clone? Well, because I'm addicted to Reddit. All right. <laughs> And, um, you know, my friend told me, he's like, that's doing weird things to your brain. I didn't listen. And so now it's the only way I can solve problems. <laughs> because, well, I mean, the thing about Reddit, though, is it's a very organized website. And so if you can get rid of the people, it's very pleasant. <laughs> and, you know, when you think about, like, I want to better my, my media consumption, 
you know, we're all familiar with this, you know, this concept of end-to-end -end encryption. We don't want things in the middle. We want, you know, end-to-end. -end. So could we do the same thing to, uh, to uh, our media consumption? Can we get as close as possible to the knowledge source without having, you know, all these grubby paws in there trying to change the message? Another thing that Reddit does, uh, yeah, it gets rid of mods and admins. This is huge. Like, I, I don't know, Reddit has a lot of drama that gets kicked out because the mods and admins did something that was seen as censorship. Um, luckily, I have not had to do any of that because I don't go to those weird subreddits, but, you know, they have a point. If, like, mods and admins can just choose to do stuff and, you know, against your, uh, against your will, is do you want that in a news source? Also, it's, it's open source with a very easy install script. And it's got this, you know, Python, the Python pro module is a, is a very decent uh, uh, module for, you know, scripting your Reddit bots. I don't know why that keeps going on. So, I just stood up this DigitalOcean droplet. It's running Ubuntu. This is, uh, the, the Reddit install script, I mean, it, uh, you can, you know, you can run it on, like, whatever version, you know, Ubuntu or whatever that can support it. If you're brave enough, you can tweak it to your heart's desires. But, like, if you want life easy and, you know, something like DigitalOcean and uh, we'll make it that easy, you can just select whatever install Reddit shell is looking for and, bam, within 15 minutes, you'll have a, a Reddit clone up and running. I wanted to leave the Reddit code alone. Yeah, I was like, once I got it up and running, I was like, all right, that's fine. So then I just used pra and bottle. Anyone here, anyone here use bottle? It's very lightweight Python uh, uh, framework. It's like, it's very lightweight, creates stupid, simple API that I can just send commands at it, and it'll just send commands at my Reddit clone. Also, I use this thing called summary API. Summary API was a life send because I had all my scrapers out. I had, you know, stuff like the natural language toolkit out and, you know, Parsi McParse face came out not too long ago, right? So I was like, wow, I can do all this stuff. But then, luckily, Summary comes out. I was like, I do all that for you. Plus, um, you know, I don't have to, uh, I mean, what it'll do, it'll go out, you can send it a link or you can send it text and it will run an analysis on it and pull out the important sentences. You know, this is literally, if you've ever seen like a too long didn't read bot, it's probably using this exact site. It's, it's great at just taking the article and munching it down to however many sentences you want. You can munch it down to a tweet you can, you know, if you wanted to. So yeah, I was very happy to, to know about these guys and I relied on them heavily. Also, look, I'm a slow reader. So if I can just shorten articles, it's like, look, I'm either going to run a 10-sentence synopsis of this article or I'm not going to read it at all. <laughs> so thanks, summary. All right. Yeah, everyone are ready for excited demo? Look, it's Reddit. Don't get too excited. <laughs> so this is, yeah, so when I said it was very simple, that was a lie. Oh, can you guys not? Because uh, I killed some of my bots, but I have one bot up and running. So yeah, it's it's uh, very simple. Like whatever you know, whatever um, you know, whatever domain uh, the um, you know the the article came from, that's going to be the subreddit. Whatever author uh, wrote it, that'll be the user. And so you know, Reddit's a great way. You can select you know all the things that were published by the Intercept, all the things that were published by that author, and you know it's that that part of the organization is done automatically. The next thing you can do is like, so let's take a look at this uh, um, summary because that's what we're looking at here. So I just I did away with titles. You know, the the journalists aren't the ones who decide an article's title. That goes to the editor. The editor wants to, um, uh, you know, he wants people to click on it. He's going to make it clickbaity. So let's get rid of it. Like I said, if we want end-to-end, -end, why not just get rid of that? He's going to try to get you to click on it, so get rid of it. And so what I have is just the top, the, the first 300 integers, or 300 characters, I mean, is Reddit's limit. So that's, you just, that's my title. 
So I read the first, you know, first couple sentences, and then we're gonna load it or we're not. Ah, oh, shoot. Oh well. I had one loaded up here. I thought I was on DEF CON. Oh wow. No, no, no. Well, and I realize I'm all, you, you all are so, so kind. I'm already over, I'm way over. All right, real quick, let me just go over this. <laughs> Tips for reading internet comments. Don't read internet comments. <laughs> all right? I, it's, first off, it's not doing good stuff for your health, all right? You get upset, you know, it's raising your blood pressure. You're using your free time or work time you know, and, and probably someone on the other end is getting paid for that, all right? So you're hurting yourself. Not only that, but I mean, we're seeing more of this. You know, first off, <laughs> if you're Russian, you're a troll, you know, but you're, you know, you're a Facebook warrior if you're British. That's some interesting propaganda in and of itself. But we're seeing more of these things called astroturfers or trolls or everyone, um, you know, very many names. Um, and that's very powerful. That's like, you know, you're, you're talking with somebody, like we were talking about in your heterotopia. You're talking with someone and you think it's real, but they're not real. And so, I, also I like this. It's like where, you know, Russia has the troll army, but you know, if you're, uh, you know, we're gonna go look at, um, we're gonna have an internet stranger tell me who I should vote for. That's above board. You know, so, even if you think you're the best internet debater in the world, you don't have an incentive, you don't have a money incentive on the line. But that's not, I would argue that that's not the main reason you shouldn't argue with internet trolls. And the main reason, I think, comes from the correct record. This was Hillary Clinton's super PAC, and they were talking about, like, yeah, we AstroTurf people. And in the statement, Lessons learned from online engagement with Bernie Bros during the Democratic primary will be applied to the rest of the primary season and the general election. So I mean, it's even if you think that like you're 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 getting good ideas out there and you're throwing them out there, you're really not. You're just helping them. You're building their their knowledge base. Uh, you know, you're helping them get better. It kind of reminds me of like uh, uh, like Rick and Morty when it comes to like those little microverses. You know, they're able, you know, you have like this internet and you're in your, your little thread and you're just, but really all you're doing is you're speeding up their testing, you're speeding up their, their knowledge of how to uh, 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 propagandize the rest of the population. Because as they, you know, come out of that, uh, out of your thread, they come into the real world and they're like, oh, we have just the commercial for you. <laughs> all right, so just don't. However, all right, so if you do insist on reading internet comments or if you want to comment with somebody, take out the public part of it. Take out the vanity part of it, you know, with, whether it comes to upvotes or, uh, you know, retweets or any of that. Just take all that and go to DM or PM, you know, see about that. You know, I think most people, you know, they've been most, they've been um, accepting. They'll talk to you on DM, on the DL. So, I mean, if you want, if you're interested, some documentaries I recommend, Manufacturing of Consent, it's about three hours long. Uh, that, this is a documentary on uh, uh, Noam Chomsky and it goes over a lot of his theories on propaganda. Century of Self is about Edward Bernays. This is the movement from like, all right, we just kicked ass in a war. Now what, what we can do? We can make a lot of money. That's what we can do. And that's what Century of Self's about. It's about turning like propaganda onto the uh, uh, private sector. Uh, some books, again, Manufacturing Consent and Propaganda by the same people. Firewall, uh, that was made by Jack Nolan. I, forgot, I don't know why I didn't put his name. Now, some sites. All right, so I didn't mention fair.org and I didn't mention on the media podcast. Uh, fair.org, you know, the fairness and accuracy in reporting. They do a lot of newsletters on how to, um, on just some bullshit that the media does. On the media podcast, uh, you know, it's about, uh, if you like Radiolab, it's kind of the same kind of the same kind of production value. They give like 15 to 50 minute podcasts 
and uh, they do some interesting topics on how the media is treating various different subjects. All right, thank you for coming. <laughs> You've been too kind. <laughs>